Welcome to lecture three. In this lecture, we're going to talk about statistical properties of composite tests. We'll explain exactly what that means shortly, but to begin, let's start with a guiding example. So let's consider GRE scores, the graduate record exam. Now typically these are composed of, let's say, two subtests, uh, and this is sort of a classical view that I know that some modern GREs have more than just this, but let's consider just the two subtests. We have the GRE verbal and the GRE quantitative. Now let's suppose that we know some population characteristics of this test. You can actually find uh, these online if you search for uh, GRE psychometrics. But for simplicity, we're going to just assume that the mean of the verbal subtest is 150 with a standard deviation of 10. So we've denoted those with the Greek letters mu and sigma respectively. And we'll also assume that the quantitative section has the exact same mean and standard deviation, 150 and 10 respectively. Now let's suppose that you score a 160 on each subtest. What is the resulting percentile rank? In other words, how do you do relative to everyone else in the distribution of total scores? So to answer that, we need to know how to compute descriptive statistics like the mean and the variance of a composite test score. And that's the purpose of today's lecture. Now this is going to require that we talk about three, uh, three new things. One is we need to talk about how to find the mean of a composite score. Second is we'll need to talk about the notion of correlation and covariance between subtests. And then the third one is that we'll need to talk about the variance of a composite. So what exactly do we mean by a composite? I keep throwing this word around. Well, let's just get that out of the way and say exactly what we mean by a composite test score. The definition that we will use is that a composite test score is the sum of two or more subtest scores. So, this is, so the example we're doing, we just have two subtests, but this easily generalizes to having three, four, on, on. Uh, and the way it works is that we write it mathematically as the composite score C is X1 plus X2, these two subset score, uh, subtest scores. So that's what we mean by a composite. It's just we add them together. So let's do the first of those new things that we need to talk about today. Let's talk first about how to compute the mean of a composite. Now I warn you, what we're about to do is going to involve some heavy mathematical notation, but I'll explain what each step means along the way, and I hope that you can uh, appreciate uh, the bigger picture of what it's saying. You don't have to necessarily follow every single step, just know what the big picture is. So we want to compute the mean. Now recall that the mean is given by, it's just you add up the scores and you divide by the number of scores you have. In symbols, we might say that the mu of, say, this x variable is the sum of the x's divided by n. So if we use that notation, that formula for mean, then we can work out what the mean of a composite would be. Inter uh, we're really interested in the mean of this composite score c. So that's just going to be the sum of the c's divided by n. Well, what are the c's? Well, we know c is a composite, so c is a sum x1 plus x2. So let's replace c with what it is mathematically, x1 plus x2. So now we're adding together these x1 plus x2s. Well, all we have to do is if we had a bunch of those to add together, we can order them however we want. So we can add all the x1s first and then add all the x2s. So that's what we mean by this next step. So in other words, instead of adding them together and then adding over your individual scores, you can simply add everyone's x1 first, that's this, or every and everyone's x2 second, that's this. Now, if you've got a sum of these things plus these things all over a common denominator, you can simply split that denominator into both parts. So we can write this now instead of one fraction as two fractions. Well, now, why on earth did I do that? Well, because you might recognize that this itself is a mean. That's just the mean of x1, and this is a mean. And so we can write that as just mu1 plus mu2. So what we've done is we've given a mathematical proof that the mean of the composite is just the mean of the first test plus the mean of the second test. 
This is not a conceptual argument. This is a mathematical proof. And so thus we can write the following statement. The mean of a composite is equal to the sum of the subtest means. And that's really nice. That's how it should be, right? If you're going to compose a test of multiple subtests, then the overall mean should just be the mean of each part added together. And that turns out that's exactly what it is. So for example, let's go back to our uh, GRE score. Our GRE is a composite of two subtests, a verbal and quantitative. So by what we've just shown, that means that the mean composite GRE is just the mean of the verbal, which I've denoted mu v, plus the mean of the quantitative, mu q. Well, we know what those are. Those are each 150. So we'll just take 150 plus 150, which of course gives us an overall mean of 300. So this tells us based on the subtest means that the mean of the composite GRE is the sum of those, which is 300. Now, we had a composite score of 160 plus 160. So we have a composite score of 320. So our next question is how does this observed composite score compare to this mean? Certainly 320 is bigger than the mean. So if these are distributed normally, which they are, then we're above 50%, but how far? What percentage is below us? What is that percentile rank? Well, to answer that, we're going to need to talk about the variance and particularly the standard deviation of those scores. So the next step then is to figure out how to compute the variance. Now, what I want you to do is to pause the video and ask yourself, okay, based on what we just found out, what do you think is the variance of a composite. How is it related to the variance of each part? And once you think you have an answer, then start that video again. Okay, I assume that you've thought about this for at least a few seconds. Do you have an idea? Well, let's figure it out. Instead of me just giving you the answer, let's work it out mathematically like we just did with the mean, and let's figure out what it has to be. How do we find the variance of a composite? Now we're going to only consider the case where the composite is two subtests. It's much more complicated when we have three or four, but we'll figure out how to deal with those at the end of the lecture. So let's just consider that the composite is two subtests. So first of all, let's remember what variance is. Remember that the variance is given by this formula. We use this notation sigma squared because it's a sum of squared deviations. So the sigma squared for x, the variance for x, is the sum of these x minus mu x squares. It's these squared deviations from the mean. And then we divide all those by n. So we're going to use that. We're going to start, just like we did last time, by writing down what the formula for the variance of this composite c would have to be. Well, it would have to be the sum of the c minus mu c's squared all over n. Now, of course, we know that c can be written as x1 plus x2. That's what it means to be a composite. And we also know that the mean of the composite is mu1 plus mu2, right? We figured that out just a second ago. So let's replace those two things. Let's write c as x1 plus x2 and mu c as mu1 plus mu2. Okay. Now things are going to get a little complicated. But first, let's just simplify a little bit more. Um, this is x1 plus x2 minus mu1 minus mu2 if we distributed that negative through there. We can rearrange those a little bit. In fact, we can rearrange that whole thing as x1 minus mu1. So in other words, just move that guy over next to x1. And x2 minus mu2 with a plus in the middle. So we're just doing a little bit of rearranging of the arithmetic there. Now, if at any point you want to stop and follow along, just pause the video and see if you can verify that statement. Okay, at this point, we're going to do what you probably remember from college algebra. I won't write it down because I don't like the acronym FOIL, first, outside, inside, last, but it is often a way for uh, people who don't do mathematics for a living to remember how you multiply things squared like this. So that's what we're going to do. Basically, the way it works is we're going to take this thing squared, and then we're going to take the outer two, and then we're going to take, uh, let's see... I'm, I'm already, oh, that's right. If we were to take this thing squared, we would actually get two of these guys right here multiplied together, and then we would finally have this one squared. 
So instead of saying what all that is, let's just write it out. This is going to be kind of long. So it turns out we have the first term squared, and then we have this one times this one, and then this one times this one in the reverse order. Well, those are just two of the same thing. And then finally, this last term squared. It looks it's getting kind of messy now. But just like above, we can do some rearranging of things. So what I'm going to do is say, you know, instead of adding all these up and then adding over each individual, I'm going to add all these first. And then I'm going to add all these. And then I'm going to add all these. In other words, I'm going to split that sum up. So I'm going to take the sum of the first terms, that's this, plus the sum of the second terms, that's this, plus the sum of the third terms, which is this. Again, all divided by n. Now, of course, just like, uh, just like before, we can say, you know what, this whole fraction, this whole numerator is being divided by n. I can simply divide the n into here and into here and into here. And if I do that and rearrange the order just a little bit, I get this right here. And I get this, and I get this. Now, why did I do that? Well, the reason is because you might recognize that these forms already mean something to us in this course. Namely, this form right here is exactly the variance of x1, right? It's the deviation from the mean of x1 squared add them all up divided by n. That's the variance. This one is the variance of x2. This one, what is that? Well, if you think back to the last lecture that we just did, lecture two, we introduced the notion of covariance. That's exactly what this is. This is the covariance between x1 and x2. And so what we find out is that the variance of the composite, in other words, this thing right here, is equal to the variance of x1 plus the variance of x2. In fact, I bet that's what some of you predicted but that's not it. There's also this part out here. Compactly, we can write it this way. It's the variance of x1 plus the variance of x2 plus two times the covariance of x1 and x2. I bet no one thought that that part would be on there as well. All right, that's what happens when you work out the math, though. So the variance of a composite is equal to the sum of the variances plus two times or twice the covariance of the two subtests, okay? So there that is in words. That might be a little surprising, but we can work with it nonetheless. Let's go back to our example. Remember our example for the GRE, uh, which consisted of verbal and quantitative. If we apply this notion of variance to that, that gives us the variance of the verbal plus the variance of the quantitative plus two times the covariance of the verbal and quantitative. So how are we going to find that? Well, we already know the variances, right? The variances were essentially given to us in the original slide. We said that the standard deviations were each 10. So to scale those up to variances, we simply square them. So we'll take 10 squared and 10 squared. So our variances for each of those subtests are 100. So we've got two parts. But what's the covariance? How do we, how do, we do that? Well, to do that, we need to go back to lecture two and remember that covariance is related to correlation. And specifically how it's related, remember that the correlation, the Pearson correlation coefficient is equal to the covariance divided by the product of the standard deviations. So to find the covariance, it really suffices to just know the correlation between the two subtests. If you know that, you can work backwards and find that covariance. And that's exactly what we're going to do. If you go back and look at what the psychometric properties of the GRE are, you'll find that the correlation between the verbal and the quantitative is around 0.35. Uh, last time I looked, it was about 0.33. So I just, I just rounded it up a little bit. Uh, this is, again, just an example. But that correlation is 0.35. So what that means is we can use this relationship here, namely that the correlation is equal to the covariance divided by the standard deviations, and just fill in what we know. We know the correlation now, and we know the two standard deviations. So if we do a little bit of algebra, we simply multiply both sides by 100, that's going to take that correlation up to a covariance of 35.
So now we know the variances and we know the covariance. Let's put it all together. We can see that the variance of the GRE is equal to, the, again, the variance of the verbal plus the variance of the quantitative plus twice the covariance between them. And in numbers, that's 100 plus 100 plus 235s, which is a total of 270. So that's the variance of the GRE, which then means that the standard deviation of the GRE, remember it's the square root of variance, is going to be about the square root of 270, which is about 16.43. So we actually have everything we need now to answer the original question, which was, what's my percentile rank? So to find the percentile rank, all we have to do is we just need to use z-scores and some sort of calculator for the normal distribution. What do I mean by that? Well, remember a z-score just indexes how far you are from the mean in terms of standard deviations, right? It's the number of standard deviations that you are above the mean. And if you know your z-score, you can go to a normal distribution calculator and figure out exactly what percentage is under the curve up to that point. So that's exactly what we'll do. Let's work out what the z-score would be. Our observed score was 320. The mean composite GRE is 300, and we just found that the standard deviation is 16.43. So if we take that difference of 20 divided by 16.43, that gives us a z-score of 1.22. So our observed score is not only above the mean, it's 1.22 standard deviations above the mean. So how does that turn into percentile rank? Well, the percentile rank is just going to be the proportion under the normal curve that are less than 1.22. In other words, the probability that z is less than 1.22. Now you can use a normal table or you can use what I teach in my courses, which is a uh, simple calculator. I've actually got one ready to go here and there's a link in the video description below as well as on the Canvas page for this course. We'll just use this normal distribution uh, standardized, but we need the lower tail because we want the probability of being less than a certain number, and we'll just put that number in as 1.22. And when we do that, we see that the proportion under the curve up to 1.22 standard deviations is 0.889. So we go back to our slides and we can see that's exactly what we found, 0.889. We need to convert that to a percent because percentile rank is on that percent scale. So that tells us that my percentile rank is 88.9 percentile, or I am better than 88.9% of the uh, distribution. So we scored higher than a lot of people, and that's how you find percentile rank based on composite scores. So we've learned a lot today. We've learned how to compute the mean and variance of a composite score. And believe it or not, that is one of the most crucial concepts for doing anything in psychometrics. This, I've been so looking forward to this lecture today. Now, before we quit, I need to mention something that will help us. Um, it was easy enough to do all the calculations uh, once we know uh, the basic principles that the mean is just the sum of the means and that the variance is the sum of the variances plus twice that covariance. But when you get more than three subtests, okay, or more than two, so three or more, uh, the formula becomes much more complicated. And so often we will use what's called the variance-covariance matrix of a composite test. It's often uh, abbreviated VCOV like this. So if you see that written, that's, that's what it means. Uh, a variance-covariance matrix is just this. It's, it's a matrix where you list the subtests along the columns as well as the rows. And then you simply fill in numbers for each cell. And what are those numbers? Well, uh, on the diagonals, so like here, let's start here first. This is the covariance of GRE verbal with GRE verbal. Now, by definition, the covariance of something with itself is the variance of that variable. So the variance of GRE verbal is 100. Okay. And similarly, the variance of GRE quantitative is also 100. So the diagonals here are just going to be the variances of each subtest. Now, what about the off diagonals? Let's look at this cell first. So this cell is the covariance of the quantitative with the verbal. And of course, we just found that out. That was 35. Okay. 
And similarly, uh, order doesn't matter here. So this cell up here will be the covariance of the verbal with the quantitative, which is exactly the same as the other order. So that means that this one is 35 as well. Okay, so why do we do this? Well, we do this because when you're computing the variance of a composite, all you have to do is add up all of the entries in the variance covariance matrix. In other words, you just take this number and this number and this number and this number written down here. Those add up to 270. That is exactly the same variance that we found earlier. Now, why on earth would you even do this? Well, let me quickly sketch what could happen if you had, say, three subtests. Okay, let's just label them X1, X2, and X3. Now, we don't need numbers. All I need to illustrate right now is that when you have three tests, what would the uh, total variance of that be? Well, what we need then is a three by three variance covariance matrix. Okay, so we'll put the subtests up here. Oops, that's a two and X3. This one is X1, X2, and X3. Okay, so now, Let's fill out these nine things, right? The diagonals, remember, these are just going to be the variances. So this is gonna be the variance of test one, and this is going to be the variance of test two, and this one will be the variance of test three. But now there's still six more things. This would be the covariance between two and one. This cell would be the covariance between three and one. This cell up here would be the variance of one and two, sorry, covariance of one and two. This cell down at the bottom would be the covariance of three and two. And hopefully you can see the pattern now. Up in the upper right would be the covariance of one and three. And then here, the last one would be the covariance of two and three. So what does this all mean? Well, if we wanna know if we have a composite where it's X1 plus X2 plus X3, then the variance of that composite is going to be, well, it's going to be the three variances on the diagonals. So sigma squared one plus sigma squared two plus sigma squared three. But there's some other stuff as well, right? So there's, let's see, I've got sigma two one and sigma one two. So that's twice the covariance of one and two because those are both going to be the same value. I've also got sigma 3, 1 and sigma 1, 3. So that's twice the covariance of sigma 1, 3. And let's see, finally, I've also got this one and this one. So I've got twice the covariance of 2 and 3. That's definitely different than what we found earlier for the composite sum. But the beauty part folks, is you don't have to think about this. If you just construct that variance covariance matrix, then all the work simply falls down to just adding up all the entries in this matrix, okay? So that's how it goes. That's the big story. The big story is the means add, but the variances don't. The variances are sub-additive, so there's extra stuff you have to add on. What is that extra stuff? Well, it's the covariances, and the easy way to keep track of them is in the variance-covariance matrix. So that's all for this lecture, and I will see you next time.